Absolutely. Please stay here with me while we okay. introduce our next speaker. Um, one of our favorites, of course, uh, Christian Sprague. Um, Sprague, I should say, uh, <laughs> sorry. Complete, he completed his graduate studies at Cornell University, where he obtained his MS and his PhD in systems with a concentration in socio-technical systems engineering. Throughout his studies, Christian has been recognized for his outstanding contributions to the field of economics and systems engineering. He's received numerous awards and honors, which you can read about on our website with his bio. Um, but basically, Christian's research focuses on the development of foundational socio-technical systems engineering methodologies That's applied wonderful. to the study of markets. Thank you, Christian, for the tongue twister in your introduction. Yeah. Appreciate that. So without further delay, I will hand it over to you, Christian, and uh, then we'll have some Q&A at the end. Great. Thank you. Okay, I'll share my slides here. Okay, everyone can see that, hopefully. Um, great. Well, uh, hopefully that, I guess I'll have another tongue twister here uh, to offer up, um, which is the title of my of this presentation. But before I do that, yeah, like Laura just said, I, I recently completed my PhD here at Cornell um, in systems engineering. And I just want to give a shout out to uh, the Cornell Center for the Study of Inequality, the Cornell Center for the Social Sciences, and the Cornell Center for the Transfer uh, Transportation Environment Community Health, as well as the Cornell Brooks School of Public Policy, all of which have uh, re been really supportive to my work here during my studies. Um, and the title of my talk, uh, also a tongue twister, is <clears throat> Using the P-Circle to Distill a Sociotechnical Systems Perspective on Markets. And uh, there's a lot packed in there. And, and really the big picture of what this talk is going to be about is to share with you all how I used systems thinking in my systems engineering PhD dissertation work to study market systems. Uh, so we got lots of system Z stuff. We have systems thinking, systems engineering, and market systems. Uh, but beside all that, the goal really is, is I mean, really, in a way, Derek cued this talk up very well for me, uh, because my goal is to show that systems thinking is universally applicable, uh, whether that's my curious four-year-old daughter, um, or it's me working on my PhD doing research, uh, you know, just as an anecdote of the applicability, because I also saw in the, uh, the comments about kindergartners. And just the other night, uh, I was sitting around the dinner table and I was, I was cutting up my dinner uh, on the plate and, and my daughter, she stops me and she says, hey, Papa, what, what kind of knife is that? And, and she's four and, and she knew as much that it was a knife, but she knew it was distinct. It was other from other kind of knives that she's seen before. And I stop and I'm, I'm kind of confused because I didn't know what she's talking about. And I, and I noticed she's pointing at the, the serrated edge on the knife and I go oh this is this is a steak knife and and immediately I just saw her her brain just be satisfied like oh okay I have a name for that and that was different because it's not like a chef's knife or a butter knife that kind of have more of a smooth edge this one has like a very jaggedy edge and and that makes sense so I have a name for that and and really what I'm going to be doing uh, during our time together today is no different I'm just going to be sharing with you how um, I made distinctions and saw the relationships and grouped things into part whole systems and uh, took perspectives, which is the foundation of DSRP theory to study markets and, and how I incorporated that into uh, a systems engineering PhD. Okay, but before that, I do need to give a brief data acknowledgement. I will be sharing some findings towards the end of our time together. Um, that is going to be using some restricted student administrative data out of uh, the Miri Center over in Michigan. And I just need to say that, you know, these are my findings with my advisor, Peter Rich, and that the that our findings don't necessarily um, aren't endorsed or reflect the views or positions of, of Miri. So just had to get that out of the way. Um, okay, so let's get going. So this talk, uh, the outline of this talk, I'm gonna be showing you three cognitive moves. So Derek just talked about the importance 
of practicing the moves. And so I'm going to be sharing three moves that I used uh, for three different parts of my dissertation. And I'm going to be showing you how I applied them in ways that led to, for, for my uh, purposes, really great results and were really, really effective uh, for doing dissertation work. Um, and those three moves are the peace circle, the part party, and, and the frameworker, which I particularly like the name of because it kind of reminds me of the Terminator for some reason, the frameworker. But um, okay, so the way I, I used these in my dissertation on a high level is I used the peace circle uh, to understand different perspectives on markets across academic disciplines and tried to synthesize them to build a systems perspective. I used a part party to describe and represent markets as a system. And then I finally used the frameworker to take those two uh, first parts of the dissertation and to analyze now real world markets and in particular school choice markets. Um, and if you don't know what these moves are, don't worry about it. I'm going to cover them uh, as we go. So let's get going. Part one. Uh, what is a P-circle? I, I need to talk about that first. So a P-circle is just a circle or a group of different perspectives. Uh, so here, each perspective, like Derek was saying in the previous talk, that a perspective is made up of two parts. It, it's the point and the view, which is why we say the, uh, I have a point of view or a viewer and the viewed or the beholder and the beheld. Um, and each perspective is unique. Uh, here I have different colors representing the perspectives, all looking at, at this one thing. And so what I wanted to do is use this cognitive move called the P-circle uh, to understand how different reference points view markets. And so that's exactly what I started off. This is kind of the literature review part of my dissertation. And what I did was I, did a, I used a P-circle to look across academic literatures for common disciplinary perspectives on markets. And here I want to caveat that by saying this is common disciplinary perspectives. This isn't necessarily uh, indicative of every single person within the discipline, but it's a general gist of what these disciplines, uh, how they view markets. And I identified five in, in particular uh, after reading a lot. Um, and those are the neoclassical economics perspective on markets, the classical economics perspective, the market design perspective, which is kind of engineering information, engineering flavor, um, the economic sociology slash institutional economics perspective, and then lastly, the science and technology studies slash performative sociology perspective. And I'm, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you how each of these perspectives on markets varies. And I'm going to distinguish them and show and compare them or relate them and how they're all different. Okay, so on a very high level in, in my work that uh, if, you, if you're interested in, I'd love to share uh, with you if, you if you are interested in the work goes deep dive into each of these perspectives more so, but on a very high level for our purposes of our time together today, the neoclassical economics perspective broadly says, and, and if you've taken an econ course, this is like the classic textbook definition that a market is, what a market is, is a group of people. That's all it. That's all it is. It's just a group of people that come together to buy and sell a product. That's what a market is. It's just the people, and they're there for this purpose of buying and selling a product. That's the market. But another perspective says, no, that's that's not really right. The market designer might say something like, really, it's it's not the people per se. It's it's the exchange mechanism. It's that algorithm that the people are using to do or to make an exchange. That's what the market is. It's that those rule or the, the, the sequence of steps that people follow that exchange mechanism to actually coordinate the, the exchange itself. And, and if someone else heard that, maybe the economic sociologist or the institutional economist, they, they might actually disagree with that even. Uh, they might say, no, it isn't really the, the, the literal exchange mechanism or the group of people. No, it's what it is, it's the regulations, it's the policies, it's the institutions, it's the norms, both informal and formal. After all, those norms are, are what enable uh, the market to exist for people to come together in a safe way and have an exchange. 
but really another person might, uh, you know, this is funny. It sounds like a beginning of a bad joke, right? And so another another person walks into the into the proverbial bar. Uh, the classical economist might come in and say, "No, actually, I don't agree with that either. I think that the the market is actually the site. It's the location. It's the marketplace. It's it's where uh, these activities of exchange are actually happening and occurring. And the market is just that." site that is hosting all of that. That's what the market is. And lastly, you have the performative sociologist or the science and technology studies scholar say, actually, I, I don't, I think that it's not so materially focused. It isn't necessarily the people or the, the rules or the place or the exchange mechanism. No, rather it's, it's the process. A market is something that happens. It's occurring. It's unfolding. It's emerging over time. It's, it's dynamical and it's in flux. It is that process after all, that produces and realizes exchange outcomes and people moving together to do uh, exchange. Okay, so as systems thinkers, we've all seen this slide. This is the story of the of the you know the seven blind men and the elephant, um, and each person thinks they're touching a different part of the elephant and, and thinking it's a different uh, a different thing. Someone's touching the tusk and, the, and they think it's a spear. Someone's touching the trunk and they think it's a snake and someone's touching the tail and they think it's a rope and so on. And, and really what we're trying to understand is, is how we can group these different perspectives to make sense of the whole. And that's the really object objective of the first part of this dissertation work, which is to synthesize these perspectives into a socio-technical systems perspective on markets. And so when I did this, I ended up coming up with this definition that is uh, probably not very surprising to the folks here, that a market is actually, it's, it's all of these things. It's not just one or the other, it's everything. It's synthesizing, it's holistic, making a market a socio-technical system, a system made up of humans and groups and technological uh, apparatus and parts uh, that, that interact, they're all interacting to why, why are they interacting? Why are these people and these groups and, and these technologies interacting? Well, it's to arrange commercial exchange, right? It's to bring about exchange opportunities. It's to manifest this capability for, for, a, for transaction. And I just want to caveat this, that, you know, this is a, a flavor of a systems engineering approach, engineering, because as engineers in an engineering uh, college at Cornell, we're very much interested in a functionality of systems, right? Systems engineering is very much rooted in out of like NASA and these kinds of under, and understanding, making sure that our systems are working right, that they're doing what they're purposed to do. And when we look at uh, a market through this way, you know, we're interested in being able to understand, well, are markets working right? Are they functioning okay? Are they doing what they're intended to do, which is to arrange commercial exchange as that core function? Um, and so this is, and this is where I landed up or ended up. So, okay, that was part one. So I took the P circle, I compared disciplinary perspectives and then group them, synthesize them and come up with a socio-technical systems engineering perspective. So now onto part two, let's take that perspective and now use it to do a part party on a market or on markets in this kind of general space. So we're gonna we're gonna put that perspective on, right? Like a pair of glasses, and we're gonna do a part party. So what is a part party? Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, a part party is just identifying the parts, the relationships within a system. And you know, as Derek likes to say, parts like to party. And how do we get the parts to party? Well, they're just like people. We make relationships, right? We we make relationships. It's funny, you know, moving and grooving and parts and partying. I think Derek has a little bit of a, a flavor here going on. I like it. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is I want to apply this move, this cognitive move called a part party made of parts, relationships, creating a system to a market when we're viewing it as a socio-technical system, okay? So let's do that. Let's start breaking down the market into its parts and its relationships, and then understand how it creates a whole system. 
So what are the parts of a market? Well, we briefly touched on it on that um, distinguishing perspective slide. We have participants, right? Buyers and sellers. We have regulators, the people that are creating the regulations and or exchange mechanism. We have third parties. We deal with these all the time, brokerages, intermediaries. Um, we have sites, which are the, they, these can be digital or physical websites, right? Amazon is a, is a well-known site for uh, the purpose of transaction, commercial exchange. Uh, but these also could be physical sites. If you've ever been to a bazaar or a flea market or a farmer's market, right? These sites happen all around us where we go to um, engage in commercial exchange. And then you also have products. Uh, that's another key part of a market. If you don't have a product, then there's no reason for exchange. Okay, so those are the parts of a market, or at least the minimum parts of a market, right? And so what's the second step of a part party? Well, it's to establish the relationships between the parts and the other parts. So let's look at the relationship between participants and the other parts of the market. So we have here in red the participants, and then its relationship between sites and products and, and so on. And really, what do participants do? When we, when we engage or participate in a market, what are we doing? Well, one, we're, we, we functionally, our role is to uh, participate by, by engaging in an exchange. And how do we do that? Well, we browse for products. When we're browsing, we are relating to products and operating within the site, right? So we're having a relationship with the site. We're having a relationship with products. We're giving and accepting offers. What are we doing when that happens? Well, we're uh, engaging with other participants, right? And we're potentially leveraging some regulations or exchange mechanisms, especially when we engage in the actual transaction, we will be utilizing the exchange mechanism. And all of this stuff in the, you know, in the background, we're relating with regulators and potentially third parties who are intermediating our exchanges. And the other main thing that participants do is to ready products for exchange, right? We are in charge of promoting products by potentially um, marketing them or advertising them on different site locations, right? At the end cap of a store, maybe you're at the grocery store and you purposely rented some space at the end cap of that store to promote your product in that site. And you're also in charge of producing your product. This is the internal purpose of the participant to make their products, which are a very intimate relationship, to bring it to market and provision that product to the site. And then they're also in charge of maintaining compliance, which is very much in the wheelhouse of your relationship to the regulators and the regulations and making sure that your product is compatible with the exchange process, the exchange mechanism, right? You think about those barcodes. What's the function of those barcodes when a producer puts it on their product? It's to make sure that that barcode creates the healthy relationship between you, that other participant through the exchange mechanism, right? Okay, let's do one more example because I don't have time to go through all of the different parts in the relationships. But let's look at the site and, and its part, and its relationships to the other parts. So I said before, the, the, the main function of a site is to host activities for exchange, right? And so how do sites do that? Well, they afford infrastructure. Think about the shelves on a grocery store. Think about the aisles of the, of the store. Right, you're for, the, the site is affording you navigation or on a website, think about the placement of the buttons or the pictures of the products. Think about the information that it's conveying through reviews. It's a three star out of a five star, or all of the customer reviews that you read all the time. These are the sites affording to you infrastructure and information to help you to host activities for exchange and help you navigate them. And you can easily see how all of these relate to participants, exchange mechanisms, other products, and so on. Okay, so that's, that's part two. So we did the part party, we, we broke down parts, we looked at relationships, and now we're going to move into defining the system boundary. And this is tricky, um, because markets, when we define them as socio-technical systems, that means that markets have open boundaries. There aren't any sort of clear cut boundaries like there would be um, on this on this table that I'm sitting at, right? There's a solid surface, a solid boundary that is the table. And markets are more open than that. They're squishy and adaptive. And, and a great way to make sure that we're getting a good market boundary is by seeing if it's capable of arranging commercial exchange. So for example, I'm going to give you two examples to, to help 
crystallize this. Let's say I want to be in the market um, for a time traveling machine, right? I really want to go buy me a time traveling machine. It's not possible. There is no market uh, that is established. There is no socio-technical system capable of arranging an exchange with me and a time traveling machine, right? I can't buy one. They don't exist. The product does not exist. There is no site uh, that I can go to to find that product. Um, there are no other participants that are interested in that, uh, in, in, in providing or provisioning that product up for exchange. Um, there sure aren't any exchange mechanisms or regulations or even regulators operating on trying to, to think about how to um, constrain and, and organize this in a regulatory policy way, time traveling machine development, um, as far as I know, at least. And, and so there is no market. We would say, oh, there's not a market for that, right? Well, think, think about that. Though there's not a market for that in that sense that I can't go to a market. I can't engage in a market for time traveling machines. But uh, let's say I want to buy a water bottle, just a simple water bottle. Uh, there is a market for that, right? And you, immediately you can think of all the site locations in your mind. Amazon is an example or the local uh, you know, chain store like a Walmart or a Target or something like that here in the States. Um, you just go to the grocery store or, or this, the, you know, the, the store and, and you, you might have a few water bottles to pick from. And there's some regulations saying, oh, it's a BPA free water bottle. There's some regulators in the background making sure that that product is, is maintaining compliance standards. And there's a site there that's hosting that water bottle on its shelf and you can take it off. And now you can walk up to this, the, you know, the counter and pay the person in, in, in some money uh, or maybe it's a, a bargain or a bartering system or something that'd be fun, uh, but transact in some way through some exchange mechanism for that water bottle. There is a whole socio-technical system in place that enables you to transact for a water bottle. And when you're, if you're, let's say you're an entrepreneur here today, you know, this is, this is often the time or the task of an entrepreneur is you have a product and you want to be able to engage in a transaction with somebody else. But there's no market in place. There's no socio-technical system built out that enables you to do that, to arrange those commercial exchange transactions. And so a large part of the task of an entrepreneur is establishing all the relationships between the different parts of a market that unlock or actually um, emerge, to use a systems-y phrase, uh, the capability for a commercial exchange to occur around that product. Okay, so we did it. We made it through part party and uh, the P-Circle. So now we're going to move into part three, which is the frameworker, which I really like. Um, so this move we're going, to, we're going to use is called the frameworker. And what we're going to do is we're going to use it to analyze now real world markets, real world markets. But before we do, what is the frameworker? Well, <clears throat> the frameworker is simply taking on a, the perspective of a system. So previously, we, we took the perspective, uh, socio-technical systems perspective, to understand markets. But now what we're going to do is we're going to take those two things, uh, part one and part two, and view markets through that whole um, framework now in the background. And so a framework is simply just taking the perspective of a system and viewing uh, something out there through that lens. Okay. So what, for example, when I'm gonna, what I'm going to show now is how I applied using the frameworker that whole um, part one and part two to analyze to view school choice markets in Michigan as these socio-technical systems that arrange uh, enrollment opportunities, right? Not necessarily commercial exchange in that traditional sense, but enrollment opportunities. Okay, so now before I do, before I show you how to analyze it, I'm gonna give you a brief walkthrough of the complexity, the amazing complexity of school choice markets in Michigan and how they go about arranging enrollment opportunities. And so I'm about to go through about three slides and they're gonna have a ton of content in them. And the point isn't necessarily for you to completely understand what school choice markets are as these socio-technical systems, but to really prove the point that it kind of took me about a year or two to wrap my own head around what the complexity of these markets are. And it takes a lot of work to walk through all the parts and all of the relationships to really get a great understanding of, of what a market is. And so just let it kind of 
wash over you and, and absorb and uh, what you may, and, and hopefully you glean something out of this. So I'm gonna, so just brace yourself. I'm gonna go machine gun mode. So here we go. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna framework, use that framework now that we just developed part one, part two to analyze uh, and to represent Michigan school choice markets. So first up, let's look at families. What do families do? Well, they're the participants in these school choice markets. So their primary function in arranging enrollment opportunities for the market is to prepare for their student for enrollment and to participate in student enrollment. So they need to prepare their student, which in this case is kind of like a product, and they need to participate in the actual enrollment process. So how do they engage, how do they prepare their student? Well, they have to select their residential location, which is like within a neighborhood. You can think about that as a site. They need to learn about the schooling options through all the different websites, learning about the information. They need to assess their child's schooling needs. They have to evaluate their child and see what kind of education services are compatible. And then they need to register their child in the local school district, right? So they need to interact with regulators and regulations and making sure everything's kosher, like is everything's in maintain compliance. The second thing that they need to do is participate in the enrollment. They do that by browsing for schools, applying for schools, enrolling the child. All of this is regulatory background, uh, policies that are in place, and exchange mechanisms that they're walking through. And so that's, that's what the family does. But the school is on the flip side of this exchange, right, of the enrollment process um, or the enrollment transaction. They prepare for student enrollment. How do they do that? They promote and advertise their school on all these different websites or different information venues. Maybe they're going to a, a convention or some sort of PTA thing where they're talking about their school. They're developing their schooling service as a service, right? They're, they're uh, expanding facilities. They're investing in their teachers in various ways. They're maintaining regulatory compliance. Um, through the Michigan Department of Education. They're provisioning student vacancies up for enrollment, right? So they're taking, they have empty seats and they're, they're provisioning up for enrollment opportunity. And then they're participating in enrollment. Um, the school might evaluate prospective students, um, maybe through applications or some other sort of evaluatory way and admit students for enrollment ultimately. So those are just the participants, but then you also have the products, right? The student and, and the school vacancies, and both of those warrant, right? They're actually giving reason for the enrollment uh, a possibility or potential. And, and their process in that is by incenting families to enroll or incenting schools to admit, right? They're, the child is asking the school to, to receive them and the family's uh, doing that with the school, conversely. And then you also have sites. There's so many sites. This is just a compressed list. List, um, But the neighborhood, what are they doing? It, it, they're hosting families and schools, right? It's affording physical infrastructure. Think about the roads and the stoplights and all of the civil infrastructure that needs to occur within neighborhoods and in areas to actually uh, make possible students to navigate and, and attend these schools. Um, and then the, not to mention registrar's office, which is a different kind of site, another site that hosts uh, enrollment applications, right? And they're providing an application process, uh, uh, affording that up. Then you also have uh, regulations. You have an eligibility criteria uh, that authorizes student eligibility and validates that that student actually meets those criteria as well as enrollment criteria, which is different than eligibility. Um, and then you have not to mention have the regulators, which are the Michigan's Department of Education that are regulating school districts and, and determining school district regulatory authority and, and just so on. I mean, there's just a lot here. Um, and not to mention the third party function of the Michigan Department of Education, which is to facilitate as an intermediary that enrollment transaction through intermediating public funds to tax uh, from taxpayers to schools, right, for the public education. Okay, wow, that was a lot. I need to take a sip. Okay, so what now, using this framework, are we going to do is we're going to empirically test. So we just meant we just made a massive mental model, which is that that person right there in their head, right? We just mapped out, we just part partied, we wanted to understand conceptually how school choice markets work. Now what we want to do is exactly what Derek said with the ST loop. Let's test this mental model uh, using real world student data uh, to see how well our mental model aligns with our uh, with the real world of enrollment outcomes. And so what I did in my dissertation, the third part of my dissertation, was I, I took that mental model 
And I just collected as much data as I possibly could about those features and their, and their relationships. So families, uh, information about families and schools, neighborhoods and where they live, the infrastructures and the distances and the commute pathways that people are going to take, historical enrollment patterns from other families and um, other participants in the market, not to mention education policies um, that affect uh, how what schools children are eligible for and um, are accessible or easily accessible. And I plug these in to a statistical model called a, a discrete choice model, um, also known as McFadden conditional logit model. And I just have this here to show you that it's possible to take a mental model, uh, generate data that describes, that's trying to empirically describe that mental model, and then start using it in a statistical model, right? So models all the way, but different kinds of models. One is mental and conceptual, and another is an empirical statistical model that we're trying to uh, align these two to, to really study the real world out there. And what I did was, I so I built this statistical model, and I will now want to measure how well these markets how well are they functioning? How well is Michigan school choice markets are, how good are they at ranging commercial or not commercial enrollment opportunities for students and for whom and where and why? What about it? Uh, what about these different markets? Uh, are they affording to different student groups uh, certain kinds of opportunities? So here's just some results. Uh, from that empirical part of, of my dissertation. So this is the number of accessible schools for different family groups. Um, on the x-axis, I have it broken out for uh, by different kinds of family groups, uh, race, urbanicity, which just is uh, urban, suburban, rural, and then SNAP status, which just is um, proxies as socioeconomic status. It stands uh, in the US, it's a supplemental nutrition assistance program. It's uh, essentially giving assistance for uh, students to receive uh, free lunches. And it's a good proxy for socioeconomic status here. And on the y-axis, we have the number of accessible schools. And so how many schools are actually easily accessible to, to students from their place of residence? And here we find that there's a large spread across all of these distributions, um, ranging from uh, you know, uh, just a couple schools all the way up to in the, on the larger side of over well over 15, which is quite a lot. And we're finding in general, you know, that the poor urban and black communities uh, tend to have access to more schools. But what's interesting is when we also break this down, not by just accessibility, but by, by high performing schools, we find just the opposite results. So now we just look at, okay, well, we want to understand what schools are accessible, but also are they high performing? And we're finding, you know, interestingly, you know, you, you get the opposite where the students with the fewer a number of schools actually have a easier access to high performing schools and students with a lot of options tend to have access to lower performing schools. And lastly, we can also evaluate very easily from this type of model, um, the market structure, which is, you know, what kind of markets are these different student groups participating in? Are they operating in monopoly market, monopolistic markets or oligopoly or competitive markets or monopolistically competitive markets? Um, and we can pretty easily identify because this is a bottom up model and measured at the student level. Um, and it's giving us a way to really showcase and, and think about uh, the real world analysis of markets through this more systemic lens. Okay, so I'm gonna recap now. Uh, I used three moves, three cognitive moves to, to flesh out my dissertation and study of markets and was ultimately able to use all of that con conceptual building, mental modeling, to empirically analyze real world markets. And the whole idea was to really showcase to you how systems thinking is universally applicable, whether that's a, a curious four-year-old or a PhD or a scientist doing research, I think we all uh, can use systems thinking. So thanks. That was great, Kristen. Thank you very much. It's a uh, great project. Um, and there's lots of lots of different questions. Um, I guess I want to start with, uh, to me, what's fascinating about what you did, because I know a little bit of the background of just how technical your project was even though your presentation is, is you know, made for kind of a, a general audience. Um, 
you really went deep into this stuff in a in a in a systems engineering school here at Cornell uh, for a PhD level kind of problem solving, and yet underneath the things that you use to sort of develop the theory or the mental model or framework uh, were literally things that are as simple as part parties and P circles and you know things like that. Say a little bit more about what, you know, something that that your daughter's doing it when you get home from your PhD work, you know, things like that. So, you know, I think for a lot of people that doesn't like, that's not the first thing they would think, right? That, that oh, yes, a, a systems engineering PhD at Cornell is going to, is there's really simple things that lie underneath. What, say, say a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Um What's interesting is after you know taking your courses and, and spending time with you, seeing uh, how to be more content agnostic, uh, you know, thinking about information and just seeing it as all similar, uh, and really learning to see the structure of mental models and really focusing on how we structure our thinking and less on what the information inside of our thinking is, really like opened my mind on how to use this uh, your your work. And so for me, once I did that, I thought, oh, like all of a sudden it, you're not intimidated by any information. Oh, I need to learn about uh, different perspectives. Okay, I'll just operationalize. I'll just start doing a peace circle, gather all of the information and try to synthesize these perspectives. Like I have a structure, I have this move that I can practice. And what's really fascinating, you know, making that explicit and metacognitive gives you that firepower, you know, that 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 power to to be less intimidated by content. And then now, you know, like I was saying about my daughter, seeing her do that, but in a less metacognitive way, in a more just, you know, implicit way. And it's fascinating to see how we do do it, but we can actually be aware of what we're already doing and then use it as like a tool in our in our cognitive toolbox to go out and and study anything that we're interested in. And for me, I was just I was always I've always been interested in markets ever since I was a little kid and seeing gas prices go up and down on the, on the, on the marquee and being like, why do gas prices go up and down? How does this work? You know? And, and I, I just had an itch and I did a PhD all the way up because I just had to satisfy that itch trying to understand the way these things work. So, yeah. Very good. So there's a couple of questions that, that are on a theme, which is what do you do when, like you, you really brought together, like you said, almost an entire literature review of, uh, just on P circles. What do you do when, when the the perspectives that that might exist are not compatible or are in conflict, or you know, like how do we know, uh, you know, or zero sum, or how do we know that we've gotten the full picture of all the perspectives? So it's kind of a double barrel or triple barrel question there, but you'll figure it out. Yeah, that that was a yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess I can double click a little bit on what I did in the P circle part is I listed out in very explicit terms, all of the identity other distinctions that the piece that the different perspectives were making. And then so you could break down the view in a very explicit terms and the point. And I compared them. And so it's true, like, I kind of glossed over, but some of these perspectives across the disciplines and markets are, there are some incommensurate or incompatibility between them. And, and so what I tried to do from a, from operationalizing my own perspective as a systems engineer was trying to highlight those parts of the perspectives that were very compatible with systems engineering and then yeah. use that. And so I, I wouldn't say like it was a perfectly seamless synthesis you have to make like these kinds of hard decisions but the beauty of of mapping it out in a, in a metacognitive way is you know what decisions you're making about how you're picking and choosing these aspects of perspective yeah very interesting you can i think you can also like um take an, an additional perspective right on on well if if i've got these two that are kind of conflicting with each other is there a perspective that I could look at that would reconcile that as a paradox, which evol evolution in nature does so well. I always say, you know, lots of people say mathematics is the language of nature. I think reconciliation of paradox is the language of nature because nature has had a long time to sort of take these seemingly paradoxical things like predator and prey and, and like reconcile them or selfishness and, and altruism and things like that. So what do you think about that? I like it. 
Yeah, okay, <laughs> that would be a, a good one to do. Can you talk more about um, this question uh, comes from a, a guest. How can we go about transposing a mental model into a statistical model? Talk a little bit more about how you, because yeah. you, you kind of came up with this model and then you applied it, you, you know, and you came up with the whole mathematical statistical model um, and data. Talk about that. Like, what was your thinking in that transition? Yes, totally. Yeah, I had to kind of speed through that part, but I'm, I'm I'm thankful that that point was raised. So when I mapped out that the, those three slides of all of the different parts, that was that made explicit what parts of the market I need to be gain, getting data from or on. And when I did that, it was very easy to just say, okay, I need data on families. I need to know where they live and what kind of schools they're proximally near and what kind of eligibility policy is happening and to, and to really start mapping out empirically with data that linkage between that mental model of that part party of the school choice market and representing it empirically with real data. And so there, I just, I just walked down almost like, you know, list wise, saying, okay, I have, I need to get data on families. I need to get data on schools. I need to get data on regulation policy. And now formatting all of that into a compatible statistical model that can take in that. And, you know, a lot of ML AI kind of models are, are very useful these days uh, for being able to just take in tons of different kinds of data to understand, you know, these kinds of enrollment outcomes or commercial exchange outcomes. It's, it's super, super great. So in a simple way, I mean, it, it really is that you're taking your model and, and then you have another model, which is your statistical model, and you're just looking like, are they analogous? Does yes, If there's a part it. over here, is, does that part exist over here? If there's a relationship over here, are we including that relationship over here? If there's a perspective over here, are we is that perspective in, embedded in the statistical model? You know, and, and if the answer is yes to all those things, then you've uh, then you've done it, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. That's a great way to say it. It's yeah, you're just trying to create a um, yeah, you're just trying to represent your empirical model as your mental model and vice versa. So yeah. Okay, so um, I'm curious to that we have like I've said several times, th this is a very broad audience, a very diverse audience. We have lots of people that are engaged in running organizations or nonprofits or small businesses or entrepreneurs or whatever. And I'm curious uh, for you to share with them, because I know a little bit of the background of your research, obviously, but um, how do you like get away from being a PhD and being a you know academic and a scholar, but if I'm running a ice cream store or I'm like, you know, I have a bus company or, you know, whatever it is, how do I use what you learned uh, for that? What yeah. can I do with it? Yeah, I was thinking about this when you were talking to Ian uh, in the first talk, asking him to take off that scientist hat in like everyday yeah. life. And um, and that's a really great question because before I can get how to use it, after doing all this, I actually had like a sense of appreciation for markets in a way that I never had before. I was like, I, I now I just drive around and I look at those gas signs, you know, those like marquees of saying gas prices or whatever prices, and just am in awe. I'm like, wow, there is a whole massive socio-technical system in place that is enabling me to just drive up here or to walk into the store and grab this thing with this money in my pocket. Like that's insane that there's this huge socio-technical system that just makes that so seamless. And, and now getting back to your point around, you know, small businesses, or even if you're a policymaker and a regulator of markets, you know, what do you do? How can you use this, this thinking or this, this way of seeing markets as a socio-technical system? Um, it's all about the relationships between the parts, honestly. Like, it's really understanding what is the relationship between the site that I'm interested in regulating or maybe bringing my product to in a, a, a website or a physical location? And how, how is that site interacting with um, the products or these regulators or these regulations or the exchange mechanism? Is the right, are we transacting the right way with this in, within this site's context? Is that relationship healthy? Are all of the relationships healthy? Because if I'm trying to bring my product to market and the site is just horribly laid out, just a horrible design, or if it's not able to engage or uh, host the correct exchange process, 
or maybe the intermediary, your third party vendor or brokerage uh, is just dropping the ball. Like all of these things cause frictions in the market system. And it's gonna hurt your ability to engage or execute a transaction. And so as entrepreneurs, as small business owners, as even policymakers thinking about where the frictions in your market are, making sure, and it, not necessarily the friction between you and the site or between you and the exchange mechanism, between those things outside of you and their relationships too, and making sure that they're healthy, the things that necessarily aren't directly related to you, but are causing you pain because the site and that regulator or regulation are butting heads. And that is actually now coming back on you and making it hard for you to engage in exchange, right? And so being really aware of the whole network of, of parts and their relationships and making sure that all the things are healthy. Um, that way you have the best shot, you know, shots on goal for arranging successful commercial exchanges. Excellent. We have one, we have lots of questions, but I can only get to one more. Um, uh, really enjoyed, lots of people are saying how much they enjoyed the talk. Uh, really enjoyed this. I'm wondering how you account for power dynamics in market interactions. I appreciate yeah. your graph with monopoly, et cetera, but there are more nuanced power dynamics that drive market behaviors, as a colleague says, because humans aren't robots. Where do those come in? Yeah, love it. Yep. And, and this is also really related. I wouldn't be surprised if this person has a sociological background, potentially, um, because the, the Econ Soch Institute and the um, Performative Sociology, this communities really do care a lot about their perspective on markets highlighting power dynamics and power imbalances. And so, and I really do appreciate that as a, as a perspective that has a really good role in market and studying markets. Um, and it's funny because then that other comment around we're not robots is probably a, a, a critique on the more econ perspective on markets, which tends to assume like a homo economicus, perfectly rational market actor. And so it's so funny because once you understand all these perspectives, you start seeing what people are operating out of or, or interested in. And I would just say, you're totally right. Markets have lots of power and imbalance or dynamics, whether that's a regulator having a ton of power over the way, the, these, the way they create and craft regulations. This is why we have this whole, literature on government capture and talking about how corporations or other kinds of bodies can capture government and regulators. But then you also have monopolistic power, which are like large firms that have abilities to sway prices all of because they have so much market share. And there's lots of other kind of local dynamics of power. And you're right, like this perspective that I'm presenting has an engineering twist, but it's also trying to synthesize all of that into one perspective and being aware and being like, oh, there is a massive power imbalance in this system and it's actually harming its ability to arrange commercial exchange effectively. And so I, I don't think it's like omitted at all, um, but it is, it, it's something that you have to be aware of and account for if you notice exchanges are being hindered. Excellent. All right, we need to wrap up this, this session, but Christians, uh, we will be taping these. We'll eventually be posting them although that takes a few weeks. Um, and and Christian, I believe your dissertation will be a part of that if people want to read, you know, something that's uh, quite, quite deep. <laughs> okay. All right. Great talk. Thanks so much, Christian.